I'm here with Al Mooney. He is the product manager for Adobe Premiere Pro, and we're at NAB 2013. We're having a look at the next version of Premiere Pro. What can you tell us? Well, it's a very exciting time for us, as you can tell. Um, CS6 was just enormous. We saw so just incredible market gain from CS6. Uh, and you know, I think that's really testament to something I'm very proud of about what we do, which is we en engage so well with the editing community. We spend so much time you know, out there talking to editors, broadcasters, post-production, independent filmmakers, um, very active on social media, and we listen and we pride ourselves on doing that. So what have they told you and what have we implemented? Well, so I, one, one of the things that I'd like to say is probably one of the biggest features of this version is, is an area which I call editing finesse. And some people don't like that term, but I do, so I'm going to stick with it. And editing finesse is really about that. It's about the fact that we've listened to the community, that we're engaging with them, and that we're responding to you know, the key things, the key problems, the key requests that they, that they have. Uh, so, you know, multiple examples of that. Let me just show you here. This is a very simple sequence, but it makes the point. So, you know, we've redesigned the timeline and the way you engage with the timeline to be so much more fluid and intuitive uh, and to present key information visually to an editor. So there's loads of examples of that. I mean, you can see here, you know, we've got this blue bar. This is a, this is a duplicate frame indicator. So pe more and more people are working on uh, long form projects in Premiere Pro and if you're cutting, I always say this, if you're cutting a three hour nature documentary and you can't remember if you've used the three second shot of a bird on a tree, duplicate frame indicators are going to help with that. Through it, that through, oh, sorry, through edit indicators as well, you can see there's a through edit right there and I would be able to heal that just by selecting the, the edit point and going to join it. Uh, very, very uh, cleaned up track headers, so much more what we call discoverable, much easier to find the key things, easier source patching, easier track targeting. Um, and just a whole bunch of things sort of throughout the, the, the UI of the timeline that really just help you when you're working on these big projects. Also, we've got uh, so many new keyboard-driven editing enhancements. And th this is responding to some of the most common requests. So a really good example of that is something that seems very simple, just the ability with a keyboard shortcut to nudge a clip up and down. But this is the thing. If, if you do something a thousand times a day, even if it seems small when you just look at it, it, it becomes this enormous thing. Um, loads and loads of other keyboard-driven enhancements, Things like being able to select the clips under the playhead, move things around more easily, uh, paste attributes functionality for moving effects from one clip to another. So I really feel like when, when someone who knows CS6 comes over to this new version, they're just going to feel every time they try and do something, I, I think there's going to be a lot of grinning going on because people are just like, oh, wow, I, you know, that's going to save me so much time. Yeah, because I know that the, the paste attributes one, to pick on one, that was one that I had challenges with. You wanted to paste the attributes from one clip to the next right. and you had to copy everything. Um, or if you did them, or you could do it in the it ECP, was, but it was yeah. clunky. And this is, I said, I said to someone earlier on today, and I'm sure I'll say it again. You know, if we can, we're, what we are focusing on is, if it takes three clicks, can we make it one? If it takes ten clicks, can we make it three? Whatever or one. You know, just removing these little things that slow you down. And people are cutting with this product in earnest for 14 hours a day. And, and you know, this it just makes such a difference. And I think that just really shows that we really care about the guys who use our products. Yeah. I think a lot of it too has to do with the fact that editors now are using, as we have in this example, uh, laptops, and we don't have necessarily um, a mouse to work with anymore. Sure. And so using this. Well, it's clunky, and yeah. I mean, you know, fast professional editors are keyboard driven, or at least the vast majority are. Now, if you're a mousy kind of a guy, feel free. You know, you can do this stuff with a mouse. But, but, the, but that's what we hear is time and time again, make the keyboard editing fluid and intuitive and fast, and that's really what we've tried to do. Okay. Let's move to multicam editing. Sure. What's new there? Well, so we did a lot of work with multicam in uh, CS6. And really, that was all about just simplifying the, the multicam experience. But we really focused on, you know, what do people want to do? What, what's, what's the, what would be the smoothest workflow for multicam? So I'll just show you a quick example. Yeah. This is an interview we shot um, on some island in Hawaii where I didn't get to go, which upset me greatly. Um, and basically, these are three different cameras. We've got one, uh, two iPhones, and a uh, and a P2 camera. And remember, never forget how you know awesome our our media is we basically support everything native from stuff shot on a phone to Red 5K and everything in between, right? That's one of our key, key, key advantages. Um, so here's these three shots, and what I can do is, you know, I want this is it's a multicam shot, and I want to work with it. So just like I could in in six, uh, I'll select across these clips, I'll right click, I'll choose create multi camera source sequence. But the big new thing, and I'll just zoom in, 
because it's a small button, but a very important feature, is that we're now able to synchronize these different angles by audio waveforms. So it's such a common situation that there, there either wasn't a clapperboard or you don't have time to use the clapperboard. You don't have time of day time code. They don't, you know, t iPhones don't take time of day time code yet. Um, so being able to just analyze the audio waveform and create that multicam source sequence from it. So all I have to do, you know, I've got a bunch of different settings I can choose from down here, but to make this simple, I'll just hit OK. That's going to automatically generate me this multi-camera source sequence, which I can just put on a timeline. We'll go new sequence from clip. If I scrub over to, you know, to this section here, and by the way, you know, this is the nice new zoom. I can just zoom right from the track header. I don't have to think about where that's going to be. Nice, nice new audio waveforms just to get that in. Um, and if I just scrub to where the multi-camera is, we also have a new right in the program monitor multi-cam button, which means, again, no clicking. You don't have to rummage around and find it. Up, drop you down, can just and right, open exactly the move the monitor. panel. All that stuff that just little things, but that add up to big things. So I can just switch it in. There I am in multi-camera mode. I can hit play. Do my edit. If anyone was ever frustrated by the fact that when we hit stop, we used to jump back to camera one, we've taken that away. So there's my multi-camera edit right down there on the timeline, and I can, you know, of course, go and make changes. But to, to sort of close the workflow out. Uh, people used to, people asked us a great deal to make it easier to export a multicam sequence. Multicam in CS6, you know, is very powerful, but if you wanted to export an XML to something else, a little bit of a dead end. So now, once you've made your multicamera edits, you can just go ahead, choose multicamera, and choose to flatten. That basically takes goes back to all the source clips. And now this is just the Premiere Pro sequence with those cuts as I placed it in there. Now I can export an XML and take it anywhere. And very briefly, um, and another really useful new feature is single sequence XML or AAF export. So we used to export the whole project. So again, all these little things just for a much smoother workflow. Editors always have multiple different formats, frame rates, everything, yep. right? And I know you can take the footage and you drop it in, it creates a new sequence. Right. But what's the best practice when you have multiple different formats, what kind of sequence setting do we want to kind of default? Is it to the highest, the lowest quality? The well, I would suggest you, so if you have. Uh, and in the multicam environment too, you had the iPhone. What did, it, what did Premiere say, this is your sequence setting? So that's a very good question. The way that works is the first clip you select is the one that it's going to assume is the basis. So that will be the first angle, and it will be the thing that the sequence settings are based on. My answer to your question about what's the best one to choose, if you have a predominant format, I would go with that. Okay. Understand that the sequence settings, uh, you know, if you look at the new sequence dialog, you've got a, gr there's a great deal of stuff in here. But basically, what you're choosing with a sequence setting is the frame rate, the aspect ratio, whether or not it's rasterized, and that's kind of it. So, you know, the, we have a lot of uh, manufacturer specific settings, but most of the time, what happens underneath is the same. Really, the best thing you can do is have a sequence setting that is based on where you want to go. So if you know your output is 1080p, 2997, interleaved for broad, interlaced for broad, interleaved, interlaced for broadcast, I would suggest you pick that. And then if you do any preview rendering or anything like that on the timeline and you want to use those things, the export format you're going to is, is going to be the right thing. Another important point, though, is this version sees uh, significant improvements to this thing we call smart rendering. And smart rendering <clears throat> means that if you just use a, 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 piece of, a, a, a piece of a file and you haven't touched it in the sense that there's no effects on it, there's no time remapping, there's nothing like that, for certain formats, we can do what we would call a smart render, which means that when you go to export, um, we won't regenerate that piece of media. We'll just pull those frames out of the file and put it there. That means faster export times uh, and higher quality. So if you know, if you're working with it, one of the formats that we support for smart rendering, make sure you use a sequence setting that has that as the preview renderer, and you're going to see much faster performance. All right. So I understand under the hood we have new advancements when it comes to the Mercury playback engine or the, the GPU acceleration. What, what can you tell me there? Yeah, there's loads. There's a lot of news there. So. Um, we, we make sure to test as many GPUs as we possibly can. Um, and you know that you can run Premiere Pro without a GPU. You don't have to have one. You can run in software-only mode. And if you're just doing cuts-only editing, that's kind of fine. As soon as you start getting into more complex sequence, you know, let's have a, let's have a quick look at this one, for example. You know, that's, uh, let's, let's just switch multi-camera off. You know, this is the sort of thing people are doing in Premiere Pro. Big, rich, complex sequences, multiple media formats. This has got R3D, DSLR, loads of stuff going on. That's where you really benefit from a GPU if you've got rich multimedia, uh, real-time effects type sequences. Um, so we like to test them, and we have tested far more this year than ever before. So the list of supported GPUs in this version is extraordinarily long. 
That's partly because we've now got both OpenCL and CUDA support on both Mac and Windows. So I, call, I talk about this as being the liberalization of the GPU, you know, far more than ever before. The other great thing is, uh, one of the worst kept secrets in the world was, if you had a GPU that would work, uh, but we hadn't tested, like one that met the requirements, that had a gig of RAM, and I never thought I would talk to a journalist about this, but I'm, I'm going to now. Um, you know, you, you, there was a way to sort of slightly hack a, a text document to get it to work in Premiere Pro. We had a long discussion about this, and we kind of realized that that's a bit stupid. If, if, if it's going to work, but we just haven't had the chance to test it, why not let the user decide whether or not he or she wants to take that risk? I think that's perfectly reasonable. So now if you have a GPU that meets the config, but that we haven't had a chance to test, because there's only so many hours in a week, um, you can enable it in the project settings dialog. We will give you a little warning saying we haven't tested it, but you know the chances are your performance is going to be great. So more people than ever can, can use GPUs. So we don't need to hack it anymore? You, no. How many GPUs can we support now? Uh, the, I, I, the number, I believe, is somewhere between 40 and 50. I'd have to double check, but it's a lot. And that's the supported ones, remember. The other big news with GPU, of course, is that we can now use multiple GPUs in the system. That's only for export, uh, but you know, for houses that are doing a, a lot of encoding to new formats, uh, oh, sorry, encoding to multiple formats, which happens more and more and more. If you're someone who needs to do a lot of encoding or transcoding, uh, being able to harness the power of multiple GPUs in the system is, a hu is hugely beneficial, and you're going to see far faster export times. Excellent. Thank you. We've been speaking with Al Mooney, product manager for Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, we're at NAB 2013. Thank you. Thank you.